recent years, Chrysler Corporation has pioneered the high volume use of electronics in automobiles and trucks. The effectiveness of these innovations is clearly shown by the wide acceptance from owners, plus the service life, performance, and reliability of these electronic components. Another factor to consider is the ease of servicing these electronic components. Take ignition systems, for instance. The breaker point ignition system served its purpose satisfactorily for many years. One of the disadvantages, however, was the frequency of periodic service required to maintain satisfactory ignition performance. The weak link in the breaker point ignition system are the points themselves. They wear out, and as a result, ignition performance falls off. With the exception of the spark plugs, which eventually wear out, the rest of the ignition system components, the coil, condenser, and ballast resistor, had been improved to the point where they should last the life of the car. So the task at hand was to find another way to duplicate the function of the breaker points. The breaker points are simply an electromechanical switch. When they open, the current flowing through the primary side of the ignition coil is interrupted, and high voltage is induced in the ignition coil's secondary winding to fire the spark plugs. The Chrysler engineers came up with a product to replace conventional breaker points. Instead of depending on a mechanical method of switching, they thought, why not use electronics to do the job? So they came up with a way to stop current flow in the primary side of the ignition coil electronically instead of mechanically. Here's how they did it. From past experience, they knew a transistor could be excited by a small amount of electric current and made to act as a switch to open a path to larger amounts of electric current. They built a transistorized electronic control unit to use as a switching station. When the unit receives a signal, it interrupts the current through the primary side of the ignition coil, which in turn induces voltage into the secondary coil winding and fires the plugs. The transistor would handle the switching part okay, but they needed something to signal the transistor when it was time to do its thing. Well, the people who deal with electronic gadgets know there's a simple way to create a small amount of electric current and came up with a solution. To demonstrate, we will use a bar magnet, small coil of wire, piece of iron, and a galvanometer. First, we connect the coil wire ends to the galvanometer. The galvanometer is simply an instrument for measuring small amounts of electric current. Next, we move the piece of iron near the end of the bar magnet with a coil around it. The galvanometer needle begins to move. This indicates a small amount of electricity is being generated when the piece of iron is moved near the end of the magnet. Here's what happens. The magnetic attraction between the magnet and the iron causes the magnetic field to increase as the iron is moved closer. The increase in the magnetic field strength excites the electrons in the wire coil, and a small amount of electric current is generated. The electric current at this point has a positive charge. When the piece of iron is moved away, the magnetic field begins to fade, and the current begins to flow in the other direction and changes from positive voltage to negative voltage. Now, let's look at how this principle is applied in the electronic ignition. The distributor housing for the electronic ignition contains essentially the same equipment that was used for the demonstration. A permanent magnet is fastened to a fishhook-shaped piece of steel. A coil of wire is wound around the hooked end of the steel piece. The ends of the coil wire lead back to the electronic control unit. Now, as you saw in the demonstration, electric current was produced when the piece of unmagnetized iron was moved near the end of the magnet. In the case of the electronic ignition, the reluctor does the job of the piece of iron. You'll notice the reluctor looks like a gear with teeth, one for each cylinder. As each reluctor tooth passes the pole piece with a coil around it, a small amount of positive electric current is produced. When the tooth passes the pole, the polarity changes to negative and signals the switching transistor in the electronic control unit to fire the spark plug. The reluctor and pickup coil work as a team with electronic control unit to fire the plugs at precisely the right instant. The reluctor and the pickup unit determine the ignition timing. The control unit determines the dwell. Air gap does not affect dwell or timing. Since the dwell has been predetermined electronically in the electronic control unit, it's no longer necessary to use a dwell meter when testing or checking an electronic ignition system. The ballast resistor for the electronic ignition system plays a dual role. The primary side has a half-ohm resistor which controls primary current as engine speed varies. The auxiliary side of the dual unit has a 5-ohm resistor to protect the control unit by limiting current in the electronic part of the circuit. In the electronic ignition system, the battery current flows through the primary winding of the ignition coil and through the electronic control unit to ground. 
When the reluctor moves past the pole piece, the pickup voltage changes from positive to negative and deactivates or turns off the control unit circuitry. This interruption of current flow in the primary circuit induces voltage in the secondary windings of the ignition coil to fire the spark plug. The first tester available for testing the electronic ignition system was the C4166 unit. As it stands, this model can be used to test 1971 and 72 electronic ignitions. However, to test 1973 electronic control units, an electronic adapter, number C4166-1, must be used in conjunction with the original tester. This adapter must be permanently installed to the electronic ignition tester wiring harness with the locking collar. The C4166-1 adapter is mounted permanently because 1971 and 72 electronic control units can also be tested with this adapter. Using the 1973 adapter does not alter the test procedure instructions which appear on the back of the C4166 electronic ignition tester. A second generation tester, C4166A, has been released recently. This unit is the same as the C4166 tester in all respects, except the adapter circuitry has been built into the unit. Also, an additional red light and a toggle switch used in checking both the 5 ohm and the half ohm circuit in the ballast resistor has been added. The electronic ignition tester is a valuable diagnostic tool and a delicate test instrument. Therefore, it should not be exposed to excessive dirt and dust for long periods of time. Also, the test leads were designed to be a specified length. Another thing to remember is the leads with the two alligator type battery clips and the dual male and female connector are used only for bench testing. They are not to be used for on the car testing. Let's get into on the car testing. Before you connect the tester, make a quick check for other component problems which could cause the ignition to perform unsatisfactorily. Remove the distributor cap and check it for hairline cracks or corroded terminals. Check the condition of the rotor while you're at it. If it shows signs of electrical discharge corrosion, pitch it and install a new one. Give the spark plug cables a thorough going over. If you suspect they're not performing at peak efficiency, test them out as outlined in the service manual. One of the requirements of accurate electronic ignition analysis with the tester is a fully charged battery in good condition. Check the battery before you begin work. Otherwise, you'll be wasting your time if you attempt to check out the system with a weak battery. Okay, let's go to work. Before you remove or install the wiring harness connector at the control unit, make sure the ignition switch is turned off. If it isn't, there's a good chance you'll damage the control unit. Remove the hold-down screw from the electronic control unit and remove the wiring harness. Connect the female tester lead to the control unit. Next, connect the male tester lead to the system control lead. The tester is now wired into the car's ignition system circuit. Don't connect any other leads on the car. Turn the ignition switch on, but be careful not to crank or start the engine. This light, the ignition input voltage light, must come on and remain on throughout all the tests. If it goes off at any time while you're making your tests, it means there's not enough input voltage from the battery to the tester to complete the test. If it didn't come on at all, check the battery terminal connections and make sure the control unit is properly grounded. Also, check the ignition switch and its wiring for an open circuit. If both of the green lights come on and all the red lights remain off, you're in good shape. This means all the components and wiring in the primary circuit are good. Okay, let's say the ignition input voltage light is on, but the other one, the control unit green light, is off. You found a problem right off the bat. The electronic control unit is bad and must be replaced. Incidentally, each of the test lights in the tester is completely independent of the others. If the control unit is okay, this green light will be on even if there's something wrong with the pickup unit, ballast resistor, or the rest of the ignition primary circuit. To complete checking the system, disconnect the ignition coil secondary wire from the distributor cap tower and hold it about a quarter of an inch away from the engine. Actuate the high voltage coil test switch on the tester and watch for a good spark between the wire and the engine. A long hot spark indicates the coil output is okay. While you're still holding the coil test switch, move the wire away from the engine until the spark stops. Watch the coil tower to make sure arcing doesn't occur. If it doesn't, the coil is okay. This completes the checking of a good system. As you probably already know, instructions for using the tester appear on the back panel of the instrument. If the auxiliary ballast circuit light is on, for instance, check the instruction chart. In this instance, it means the 5-ohm side of the dual ballast resistor is bad and needs replacement. 
Here's something to watch for. If you have the early tester, C4166, the half ohm side of the dual ballast resistor is checked with the rest of the primary circuit by the tester. If you have the new tester, C4166A, use the toggle switch to test the ballast resistor. Momentarily hold the switch in the 5 ohm, then the half ohm position. If the light is lit in either position, check the ballast resistor and its associated wiring. If the light is lit in both positions, check for crossed wires in ballast circuits. If the red light labeled primary circuit comes on, check the ignition coil primary, the half ohm side of the dual ballast resistor, and the wiring harness for an open in the circuit. Replace any faulty parts. If the pickup circuit light comes on, the pickup unit or its wiring is faulty and must be replaced. Even if the light doesn't come on, it's a good idea to flex the wiring from the pickup unit to double check it. If the red light blinks, replace the pickup unit. Now let's get into bench testing. Once again, a fully charged 12 volt battery is absolutely necessary for the tester to analyze the components. Connect the pickup connector to the tester. If the pickup circuit light comes on, the unit is faulty. Flex the wires to see if the light will blink. Incidentally, the components do not have to be grounded when they're bench tested. As you can see, the green control unit light is off and the red primary circuit and auxiliary ballast lights are on. This is normal because there is no input for these circuits when you're bench testing the pickup unit. When you bench test the control unit, you need only be concerned with the green input voltage light and the green control unit lights being on. The red lights will also be on, but you can ignore those. The ballast resistor, pickup unit, and coil primary circuits are not connected into the tester circuit. If the green control unit light does not come on, replace the unit. Well, that about covers troubleshooting with the electronic ignition tester. There's one more simple test you can make if a customer complains of hard starting. The air gap between the reluctor and the pole piece may be too wide. It should be eight thousandths of an inch. If it's necessary to reset the gap, loosen the pickup adjusting screw, align a reluctor tooth with the pole piece, and insert an eight thousandths non-magnetic feeler between the tooth and the pole piece. Tighten the adjusting screw and remove the feeler. Remember, the air gap does not affect timing or dwell. After setting the air gap, run the distributor on a test stand and apply vacuum to the vacuum unit to make sure the reluctor teeth do not hit the pole piece during vacuum advance. On a final note, the teeth on the reluctor are supposed to be sharp so they can decrease the magnetic field quickly and induce the negative voltage in the pickup coil. Don't try to clean them up with a file. You may round off the edges. Well, that's about it for this session. As always, see the reference book for additional information. And remember, don't touch the switching transistor when the engine's running or you'll get zapped.